Okay, so my copy of Dungeons and Dragons, Dragons of Stormwreck Isle just got here. It's the new starter set. I recorded a short unboxing video to show what comes in the box, and then I recorded a flip through of the adventure. So now I thought I would record a flip through of the starter set rulebook. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So obviously here we have the front cover and then the table of contents down here. And we'll open that up. And on page one, you know, we have what you would expect. Welcome to Dungeons and Dragons, you know, that kind of thing. And then it tells you, you know, what's in the set. You get your rule book, which we're reading now, the adventure booklet, your character sheets, and then the dice. And we saw all of that in the unboxing video. Then there's a getting started section here. I'm actually curious what this says. It says, if this is your first time playing D&D, &D, start by reading the rest of this introduction and chapter one. They tell you the most important rules for play. Visit the website they have listed there for additional guidance, and they give you a QR code. Uh, the next step is to decide who is going to run the adventure. That person is called the Dungeon Master, and who's going to play. All right? And then being a player. So let's take a look at this really quick. Uh, each player chooses a character, an adventurer, who teams up with the other player's adventurers. This set comes with several characters to choose from, each one printed on their own sheet. Take a look at each of the sheets and choose the character who looks the most fun to play. Whichever character you and the other players choose, the characters are assumed to be allies as they face the dangers of D&D together. The DM presents exciting challenges, new friends, and handsome rewards to your characters. The DM is not your foe, but does present dangers that provide opportunities for your adventurers to shine and then thrive. The adventure in this set works best for four or five characters. So if you have fewer than four players, we recommend some of you play more than one character. I don't find that terribly practical for new players, but what do I know? And then this section is, you know, being the DM. So it's going to talk about the role of the DM. Let's look at that a little bit. Instead of choosing a character, one participant takes on the role of the DM, the game's lead storyteller and referee. The DM run, runs the adventure for the characters who navigate its hazards and decide which paths to explore. The DM describes the locations and cr creatures that the adventurers face, and the players decide what they want their characters to do. Then the DM, using imagination and the game's rules, determines the results of the adventurer's actions and narrates what they experience. Because the DM can improvise to react to anything the players attempt, D&D is infinitely flexible. If you decide to be the DM, make sure to familiarize yourself with this rulebook and read the adventure booklet. You'll then be ready to gather your friends together to play. And then we have uh, the rhythm of play, and then they give you a little example of, like, the interaction that might occur. And then over here, uh, a bit of an example of, you know, what the DM is doing. You know, they're describing the environment. Uh, then the players decide what they're going to do. And then the DM, you know, narrates the results of what's going on there. And then here it talks about the dice. And then terms to remember, such as adventure, character sheet, creature, dungeon encounter, monster, object, player, character, and stat block. And then a little what's next section down here says, if you'd like to delve deeper into D&D, check out the 5th edition Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, and Dungeon Master's Guide. These advanced rulebooks introduce you to the vast multiverse of D&D and invite you, to create, uh, invite you to create characters and worlds within it. All right, so chapter one, playing the game. So this is going this is going over the abilities, like what what all this stuff means: strength, dexterity, constitution, and intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And gives a a table here with your the modifier that you would have. So if you have a you know a ten strength, you would have no modifier. If you have a 15 strength, you'd have a plus two. Uh, the D20, 
the, the primary dice, one of the dice that's used most often. Talks about, you know, ability checks, saving throws, that kind of thing. And just giving you an outline of what to do. And then here we're talking about difficulty class. So if a DC is 5, it's a very easy thing to complete. Um, if it's, you know, 20, it's very hard. And you would have to roll really high and or have a high modifier to, to achieve that. Uh, proficiencies. <clears throat> says the character sheet notes the things that the character is especially good at, which are known as the character's proficiencies. Here are the main proficiencies along with page references to the rules and then how to use your proficiency bonus uh, the bonus doesn't stack advantage and disadvantage ability checks making an ability check and giving you a breakdown of how the ability checks are done so typical stuff that you would expect in a, in a rule book and we have a, a skills table here so it's just some examples. So if you're using a skill of strength or an ability, uh, I guess the skill of athletics uses the ability, the strength ability, and examples are that you can jump farther than normal, stay afloat on rough water, or you can break something. Moving on. Uh, working together, sometimes two or more characters team up to attempt a task. The characters, the character who's leading the effort or the one with the highest ability modifier can make an ability check with advantage, reflecting, reflecting the help provided by the other characters. In combat, this requires the help action. Uh, saving throws, social interaction... And then information about the alignment, role-playing. says uh, role-playing is literally the act of playing out a role. In this case, it's you as a player determining how your character thinks, acts, and talks. Role-playing is part of every aspect of the game, and it comes to the, uh, comes to the fore during social interactions. So this would be you know, using a different voice, um, acting shifty. If you're trying to be deceptive, acting heroic or noble, that kind of thing. Ability checks, the environment. So adventuring involves delving into places that are dangerous and full of mysteries. The rules in this section cover some of the ways adventurers interact with the environment in such places. So here we talk about travel. Um, you know, sometimes you travel fast, sometimes you travel slow. Falling, a creature that falls takes 1d6 bludgeoning damage at the end of the fall for every 10 feet it fell to a maximum of 20d6. So that's a bit about falling. Here's some information about vision. You know, if you have dark vision or if your vision is, if there's fog, how you know, probably how far you can see, that kind of thing. Light, bright light, dim light, darkness. Hiding, passive perception, uh, suffocating, combat. Adventurers encounter many dangers, uh, many dangerous monsters and nefarious villains. In those moments, combat breaks out. So this goes into the order of combat. A typical combat encounter is a clash between two sides, a flurry of weapons, a flurry of weapon swings, feints, parries, footwork, and spell casting. The game organizes combat into a cycle of rounds and turns. A round represents about six seconds in the game world. During a round, each participant in a battle takes a turn. The order of turns is determined at the beginning of combat when everyone rolls initiative. Uh, once everyone has taken a turn, the fight continues to the next round if neither side is defeated. And then this is the uh, kind of what you do in combat. Uh, once you play the game a few times, all of this just kind of happens quickly. You know, determine surprise, establish positions, roll your initiative, take your turns, begin the next round. 
uh, surprise initiative, uh, some things you can do during your turn, reactions, movement and position, creature sizes, the difference between like a tiny creature, medium, and so on, uh, breaking up your move, difficult terrain. So if the terrain you're on, on is difficult, it can cut your movement in half. Uh, being prone, like if you're lying down versus standing up. Moving around other creatures, flying, climbing, all this kind of stuff. And then high jumps, and then actions in combat. So you can attack, cast a spell, dash, disengage, dodge. You can help somebody else, you can hide. You can ready, uh, ready an action, or ready, you can search, use a magic item, uh, making an attack. So when you take the attack action, you can make a weapon attack. If you take the cast a spell action, some spells involve making a spell attack, and the use a magic item, use an object, and use a special ability actions sometimes involve an, uh, an item or a feature that requires an attack. So here's more about attacking. And a section on cover. You can use certain objects to gain a certain amount of cover. Uh, if the object is small, you might only get half cover. If it's a little bit bigger, you can get you know, three quarters of cover. And if it's a large enough object, you know, you can be completely, like if it's a huge rock or boulder, you can't be uh, seen at all and can't really be hit. Uh, ranged attacks, so bows, melee attacks, swords, knives. Uh, grappling, so if you grab onto somebody, somebody grabs onto you. <laughs> shoving unarmed strikes uh, damage and healing so injury and death are a constant threat in D&D as detailed in the following rules so hit points every creature has hit points which represent a combination of physical and mental durability the will to live and luck creatures with more hit points are more difficult to kill those with fewer hit points are more fragile uh, creatures current hit points usually just called hit points can be any number of the creature's hit point maximum down to zero, and it never goes lower than zero. This number changes frequently as creatures take damage or receive healing. When a creature takes damage, the damage is subtracted from its hit points. The loss of hit points has no effect on a creature's capabilities until the creature drops to zero hit points. And then damage rolls, critical hits, Damage, resistance, and vulnerability, healing, and then drop into zero. So when a character drops to zero hit points, they either die outright or fall unconscious, as explained below. A monster just dies outright when it drops to zero hit points unless the DM decides to treat the monster like a character. Instant death. Massive damage can kill a character instantly. When, re when damage reduces a character to zero hit points, and there is damage remaining, the character dies if the remaining damage equals or exceeds their hit point maximum. So for example, a wizard with a maximum of 12 hit points currently has 6. If the wizard takes 18 damage from a, an attack, the wizard is reduced to 0 hit points, but 12 damage remains. Because the remaining damage equals the hit points maximum, the wizard dies. So you can go to 0, and then technically, you know, you could, uh, you wouldn't drop to negative one, negative two, but you could, you could still absorb one, two, three, four, or five hit points. But if the total number of hit points exceeds your total hit points, then you just die outright. Falling unconscious, if, a da if damage reduces a character to zero hit points and isn't fatal, like we saw up here, the character falls unconscious. This unconsciousness ends if the character remain, uh, regains any hit points. And then, and then this explains death saves, so when you're unconscious and at zero hit points, 
you have a chance to roll a dice, and if you get uh, three saves, then you gain one hit point, I believe, and you're back up and going. Uh, but if you roll a, a, a one on your d20, that's the same as taking two fails. So damage at zero hit points. If a character takes any damage while at zero hit points, the character suffers one death saving throw failure. If the if the damage is from a critical hit, it's two failures instead. So you gotta be you gotta watch your down players. Then you can stabilize by healing, doing some medicine checks, uh, knocking a creature out, harming objects, uh, mounted combat. Underwater combat, resting. So this just explains like a short rest versus a long rest. A short rest is at least one hour. You can get some hit points back. A long rest is at least eight hours, depending on your uh, depending on your race. And you'll get all your hit points back. Chapter two equipment. So money and stuff to buy. It's all covered here. Armor, weapons. And then here's a, a table with the weapons. You got your club dagger, all this stuff, and this what it would cost, how much it would weigh you down, and you know what kind of damage it does. So if you have a, a mace, it does 1d6 bludgeoning. And then information about range. And everything here. Improvised weapons, picking up a rock and throwing it or using it as a weapon, that kind of thing. Adventuring gear, candles, disguise kits, healer kits, holy water, all this kind of thing. Chapter 3, Spells. So this would be, how do, how do you deal with all the spell casting stuff? Gaining spells, casting spells, spells levels, spell slots, can trips, which are things that you can do all the time without using a spell slot. And some spells require components. Perhaps a time span of, a, of some spells. And then the different ways some spells can work, like it can be like a laser beam, it might be like a cone of effect, could be a square that encompasses your whole party, it might be a cube, or rather a sphere, a cylinder, and then you just get your descriptions here of what those are all about. And then targets, potentially combining spells, spell descriptions. So this is going to be your breakdown of the different spells that are outlined in the in the starter kit. Got bless, command, comprehend languages, cure wounds, detect magic, flaming sphere. Guiding bolt, healing word, hold person, invisibility, lesser restoration, light, mage armor. Mage Hand, Magic Missile, Misty Step, Press, Prestidigation, Prestidigation, Protection from Good and Evil, Ray or Ray of Frost, Ray of Sickness, Sacred Flame, Sanctuary, Shatter, Shield, Shield of Faith, Shocking Grasp. Sleep, Spirit Weapon, Thamaturgy, I did not pronounce that correctly, I'm positive, Thunder Wave, and that's it. Now we're on to the back cover, and just an appendix of conditions. So a condition temporarily alters a creature's capabilities. The definitions on this page specify what happens to a creature while it is affected by a condition. So, for example, you can be blinded, so a blinded creature obviously can't see, and they automatically fail any ability check that requires sight. Attack rolls against the creature have advantage because they can't see, so it's hard for them to dodge. Then you have charmed, deafened, frightened, grappled, 
incapacitated, invisible, paralyzed, poisoned. A poisoned creature has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Uh, you can be prone, can be restrained, stunned, or unconscious. All right, so that is a look as a flip through of the starter set rulebook.